Oh, we need to get everyone going. Okay. So the first question came in from Santiago. So thank you, Santiago. So it might be a softball, but what are the Hallmark early warning signs of diabetes or cardiovascular disease for non-morbid obese, i.e. sarcopenia obese, skinny fat? I think folks sometimes assume you have to look physically obese to be at risk for diabetes. Okay, well, this is a very, very interesting question. I think probably one of the biggest do get, it looks like these cases of very young men who look very thin, who eat very nutritionally poor diets, and they have not put weight on. And they have a lot of that skinny fat going on. And so I think that is often a gain from poor diets, nutritionally low diets. And maybe they just have kind of the age factor that's keeping that metabolism a little bit higher. And they just aren't putting the weight on. But potentially in the future, if they continued to eat those diets, they would become much heavier. I would think that's a big part of it. Also, alcoholics are somebody who would fall probably into potentially having type 2 diabetes because of the blood sugar from the alcohol. Alcohol has sugar. The ethanol is going to increase that. Potent, uh, potentially, and also increase the risk for cardiovascular disease. So potentially, those people are either, and you can have these, and they're not, you know, I've seen where you, I've watched a program in the UK with very young men in their 20s, and they literally only ate like a bag of sweets a day. And that was like, so they were kind of eating sugar, maybe not in the quantities of these folks, but their diets were very nutritionally deficit with the fast food. They just may not binge and eat in the same quantities. And that potentially is going to lead to problems at the end of the day. Because they may not be physically active. Or maybe they are physically active with it too. Professional kickboxer. But instead of eating like a champion, he survives on a sugary liquid diet. I don't eat breakfast. I'll just have like an energy drink because um, it fills me up and moves the need to eat. Consuming as many as six cans every day, Jake's riding an eternal sugar roller coaster and is relying on these drinks to sustain his energy levels. It's the instant kick that you get, and because it is instant, you do obviously feel the need to sort of later on have another one to keep the energy going. Jake is very aware just how accustomed his body has become to his energy drinking habit. If you don't have energy drinks through the day, I just probably just pass out. Mum Liz is also worried about the effects the energy drinks are having on him. His sugar levels are going berserk. It can become irritable. Do you have to have them energy drinks? Yeah. It drives me mad. When Jake can be bothered to eat, he likes to keep things plain and simple. My favourite snack is their cotton. You've got jam and a layer of ice in. It is delicious. Jake's weight has always been a worry for him. There's never been a time in my life where I've been happy with my weight. I've always been skinny. I've been bullied. School was terrible. Obviously, I was smaller than everyone else. It did kind of affect me, and people used, used that to get at me. Jake wants to take his fitness to another level and build a career from it, but he knows that his poor diet is what's preventing him. I'm never going to be as fit as I can be with the body I've got now. And uh, if I'm going to teach people, I need to set a physical example. I want to look healthy and look fit. And I've seen that not with type 2 diabetes, but I've seen runners who have been running half marathons completely healthy great cholesterol labs and next thing you know they're having a heart attack in a race because they've got plaque build up in the arteries because they really their diet was the problem so a lot of times and they always say you can't outrun a bad diet and it's true you do need to have a good diet in order to have that you know magic body that everybody wants to have it really and 
the pills and the magic teas and all of those things are probably going to lead you more to having a medical problem than actually having health. So just be cautious. Yeah, what we got here? Uh, let me see. Fat people. Yeah, no, only fat people are diabetic. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And I think that's a stigma that should be, and I'm sorry, my, my little thing's up here, but that's a stigma too, because I've certainly met a lot of alcoholics who are diabetics, type 2, <laughs> and uh, other people who have not, and night shift workers. I mean, I had a moment where I was getting very concerned myself with my own blood sugars. Because I was starting to, I was working night shifts. Uh, I was not getting great sleep in the day, and my exercise was going down. It was hard because I was doing a lot of shifts too. Because we were short staffed, it's during COVID, and uh, yeah, it was hard. It was hard on the body, and so shift work sometimes can potentially lead to these types of problems. And they're doing more research into that. And unfortunately, a lot of us who work in healthcare have been affected by that shift work. And there's a lot of other professions, a lot of the emergency services, oh my gosh, EMTs, police, and then you've got factory workers, uh, people at gas stations. I mean, there's so many people that work night jobs, you know, and in reality, it is not very good for us. So that could be part of it. All right, let's get to the next question. And then we'll bring back foodie. Yeah, shift workers are more prone to diabetes. Yes, maybe you can't see this, but yes, it's yes, they absolutely are. Yes, so yeah, that is just one of you know, and it's just unfortunate. And uh, we have to make money to live. It's not like we get a choice to not work. You know, some of us in healthcare, there were times that people like the shift the night shift more because it's quieter on the floor it's a little less hectic it's not so many docs around and trying to do orders and so forth it's the pay it's just you know not so much family coming through so there's a lot of people that prefer the environment at night at the hospital but it is very hard on the body i've i've done quite a lot of night shift i never like night shift oh it's hard it's hard it's tough. It's tough. Anyone who's done night shift out there knows. So thank you, Santiago. Okay, next question. All right. All right. The next one was from Fever M. What impacts might her uncontrolled diabetes be having on her heart cardiovascular system? <laughs> A lot. I mean, where do I begin? I think I wrote a paper about this recently for school. I did the, I'm going to make this quick. And then we're going to bring a little bit more of foodie back. Or we'll get one more question. Bring a little bit more of foodie. And then we'll do a few more questions. And then we'll, we'll just keep going back and forth. But uh, yeah, Chantel's diabetes is very self-imposed yeah absolutely absolutely <laughs> well one thing with not controlling your diabetes and we can go we'll we'll get on we'll keep continuing this conversation because i think we need to continue a conversation around diabetes nobody wants to pay for the health care and nobody wants to pay with their quality of life being affected because of chronic diseases that a lot of us have choices that we can make in order to try to make sure we have less potential of having these and minimizing the risk factors, I think, is the big thing. So diabetes causes uh, microvascular tears. <laughs> to breathe neglected thoughts, yes. <laughs> yeah, I really, well, it's because it's so much damage that it does, Em, and I'm just trying to think what, what isn't it doing to our heart system, you know, or what's the simplest response I can give? But diabetes can affect the heart in a number of different ways. Two of the primary things, you know, there's, oh my gosh, there's, there's all sorts of inflammatory syndromes, metabolic. The biggest thing I think 
and this is where the heart goes and is what's known as metabolic syndrome. And I think we could probably talk about this a little bit. I don't want to get too much into the technicalities of all the health aspects. But metabolic syndrome is a big part that goes along with diabetes. And there is a whole group of different diseases like dyslipidemia, which is having problems with your cholesterol. So if you have ever had to be recommended to take a statin medication, then that could be dyslipidemia. There is also the inflammation that comes with it. There is the atherosclerotic, because the diabetes can also start to lead to plaque buildup in the heart arteries, which could then lead to potentials for a cardiac event, uh, including myocardial infarction, better known as a heart attack. Uh, there's also microvascular tears that are caused from the sugars being in the bloodstream, and that can cause all types of other issues. Uh, it's a lot. It has a lot of impact. So I guess at the sort of the long short of it, uh, there's the high possibility, and I think uh, Miss Cold Turkey will agree with me, is the, um, oh, you'll catch the rest. Oh, that's it. I hope so. Yeah, they're a spicy. Catch it. More fun. Yeah, yeah, they're... they're um, I think there's um, they're still doing a lot of research into this as, as to what happens because obviously our body goes through certain important functions as we sleep and we do have circadian rhythms that we ought to follow. So obviously if we're kind of going against nature, what processes that we go chemically that we're supposed to be going at night when it's dark and when we're sleeping that we're affecting when we're being up at night and kind of reversing that that cycle and so there are some evidence that it could potentially you know lead to heart and i did see that with my own blood sugar which is why i stopped working nights because it was and i it was bad yeah yeah plaque buildup yeah yeah oh on and on the plaque buildup the the metabolic syndrome the dyslipidemia the it, the increased risk for for heart attacks i mean the list goes on and on so why we see so many patients with the heart and the diabetes that, that go hand in hand, which is why I'm so excited to get a diabetes educator because I love the heart. And because we just, we, I used to call them all the time to get consultation with my heart patients. I uh, knowing that potentially the reason why they were getting the blockages into that cardiovascular system was also being from the patient having the diabetes as well. Your doctor told you you should be in the ER with those numbers. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she's, she's, oh, the 29 70 liver. Yeah. That's, she's not in a good place. Okay. Next question. She's in a really bad place, man. All right. Next question. All right. Here we go. It says, it is she just as much or more at risk uh, we kind of just talked about this so these some of these questions we've kind of touched on but we're just bringing them up because i think you can be for taking the time to stop into the community and leave your question for me so it says is she just as much or more at risk for heart attack and or stroke for her weight slash lifestyle as she is from her uncontrolled diabetes meaning Seems she's fooled herself into a sense of security with her diabetes being managed, which it clearly isn't, but she fails to see her high risk for a heart attack and stroke. Yeah, I think Chantel pretty deluded. <laughs> I think she's delulu. Is that the term? Is that what the kids are calling it nowadays? Delulu? Yeah, I think Chantel pretty delulu. Um, I... It's... Okay, so... When you have, yeah, more, more, yeah, thank you. Yeah, more than just that, yeah. She, so, with all of the, 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 all the body systems work hand in hand together. So, obviously, with her, she's probably, who's, who's knows the chicken and the egg with Chantel? What came first? 
cardiac problems or diabetes, probably cardiac because the blood pressure is usually the first thing that starts increasing with people most of the time. It's very rare to have, um, I mean, it can happen. I have had diabetics with low blood pressure, but a lot of times they're medicated to be low. So it's hard to say, but I have had it. Well, I have had diabetics who've lost a significant amount of weight following a heart attack and have then had low blood pressure. <laughs> But I think they might have still been on medications. So, yeah, um, I would say, well, see, the thing is, is diabetes is, is, is one of these chronic conditions that it would never be the reason why you would see it on, like, if somebody passed away. They would never say from unmanaged type 2 diabetes. There is going to be an event that's going to happen to another organ system, probably the heart, and then that heart could then have other potential problems so or the stroke because the heart isn't working properly. So you have more potential of having uh, neurological issues or having um, kidney issues because the heart goes and with maybe something like a heart attack, you can have an acute kidney injury and that can take your kidneys down. Or if you start to have heart failure, which Chantel holding so much edema could potentially be showing signs of heart failure and as well as just sort of fluid overload from the immense amounts of sodium that she consumes. But, you know, it's kind of the problems with the heart and the sodium and the fluid overload, they kind of sometimes go hand in hand together. Um, so it's hard to kind of... You know, this is like, she's, well, she's definitely been fooled into a sense of security because she's not managed her diabetes. And I doubt she's managing anything about her heart because she's not eating well enough and she's not doing enough physical activity. But it should be at least 30 minutes a day. And it doesn't have to be, it just can be a walk. It doesn't have to be anything crazy. You don't have to join an expensive gym. I know some neighborhoods are hard. You can do just walking lunges in your own home up to a place where you feel that you've got an elevated heart rate and just keep continuing it for maybe five minutes more. Just, you know, you just want to kind of get your heart pumping. There's ways to use videos to get, you know, some imp some cardiovascular, I would look, you know, for cardiovascular home exercises that just kind of focus on that heart muscle. But she's not doing anything. Yeah, she's um, she's probably the diabetes is more likely going to lead to her potentially having a cardiac event if she does not start to. Yeah, she's basically drowning her system. Yeah, it's hard to know which is the chicken on the egg with her. I mean, you would just have to get everything regulated. You know, you would have to get a full hemodynamic. I am surprised she doesn't have more heart issues. I'm surprised. It, she's, it's going to come along. The, the, it, it has to come along at some point because the diabetes and all of this inflammation that goes along with it and the problems with the cholesterol, all of those are risk factors to increase a, a, a heart event. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she's, and I think she's losing Cali Cat. I think she, I'm sorry, I, I try not to bring up this because my little bar down here. I think Cali Cat, part of the problem is about the food is that she's not getting the same, like uh, cold turkey, like with the diabetes, it can affect your taste buds over time. So she's not tasting it either. So she's still, she's not getting the bang for the buck on the flavor from the food which is why potentially she is craving so much of this high sugar, high salt, because, you know, that's got the food addiction to it. It's going to have the, you know, those taste buds hopefully will be, you know, lit up from it, which is why it's so important to not, you know, overstimulate the taste buds sometimes. She, I don't, Ray, uh, love to see her. Oh, oh, I would love to see her real labs. Full panel, man. 
I mean, I'm thinking like, I want to see everything right down to the thyroid. <laughs> I want to see a TSH. I don't know what's going on with that thyroid. I mean, she could be having all sorts of thyroid issues. I mean, everything starts, it's a cascade. So, you know, and this is, you know, and she is going to cascade at one point and I feel she's going to be not home and she's going to be, it's going to, it's her, her fall will be bad. I mean, to like weeks of recovery. I mean, it's, it's long and hard. And our young lady, Callie, who is on the LVAD here, can attest to that. How, obviously, being on an LVAD is very, that's called, a, that, an LVAD is a left ventricular assistive device. So Callie basically has a little device that she carries with her that helps make sure that her left ventricle remains pumping. It basically does the work of the left ventricle. It's basically her left ventricle until she can get a new heart. And Fudi should be careful because she may not be able to get to that. Do you know what I mean? It's nothing to mess with. You can't, you know, you don't want to mess with your heart. You really don't. All right, next question. And then I think we'll see the rest of Foodie's video. These were great questions. Thank you, guys. And look how I fixed them up. Thank God before the chair. <laughs> I think we talked to some Jay. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate your question. It says, how does eating a whole pizza impact your heart? <laughs> well, that pizza, with all of the carbohydrates, the sodium, what would happen is, you know, if you're not exercising and obviously have the type of, and even then, I don't think exercise, I would even still recommend these types of processed pizzas and things of that nature. Just because I've had patients who still have cholesterol numbers that show up great and have got blockages in their arteries on their heart, not the LAD, but another more minor artery. Um, I can't remember which one, so I'm not say. But he ended up having that infault at the end of a half marathon. So <laughs> the moral of that story or the lesson of that story is even somebody who was exercising and technically burning it away and was thin and was doing all and was in his 50s and was trim looking, had was not diabetic, like I said, great cholesterol numbers, had a heart attack. So they that's why it's so hard to know. And really, I think a lot of it is to do with eating a great deal of processed food and just how it's made. I don't think it is benefiting us nutritionally and physically at the end of the day. And it's doing a little bit more damage and harm because of its low quality of nutrition than I think. And I think we're just starting to really see the effects because we're starting to have more generations of people who this has been more of their main diet than say somebody like me who grew up in the 70s and we didn't eat a lot of fast food and we just you know my family just didn't eat a lot of that stuff i mean if we got a tv dinner that was like that was considered a treat and those things are terrible <laughs> all right one more question because i think i had eight and then we'll go back to foodie Finish foodie out. I, I kind of split this up and then we'll get, we'll finish out the questions. Oh, right. So I'm not sure about this one. And maybe, I don't know if, if cold turkey knows, um, if the thinning of the blood, she said her blood was thin. Is it possible she had a clot and they've put her on a blood thinner? Now, I've had questions because I'm not familiar, obviously, with Kuwait. I am familiar with, you know, traveling and understanding that if you're a tourist in a country, you're probably not going to be able, unless you're very wealthy and can afford concierge medical care, to have a primary care physician 
I've had people drop me uh, comments that there's no way that you could be in Kuwait and have, they would expect her to go back to Canada and have this managed by her doctor. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. They would not just expect for her to um, be coming to them for long-term management. These are chronic conditions, uh, even things that would have you on blood thinners, uh, clot, unless, unless I said it's the insects. Right, and that's worrying me too. Um, you think it's the insects, Ashley? Yeah, and she's been taking a lot of insects. And, I mean, aspirin definitely will thin some blood. Um, I'm not sure about the others. I do know they can cause for, for obviously more pr uh, proneness for bleeding and why we don't recommend patients who are cardiac patients to ever take NSAIDs. So acetaminophen up to 3,200 milligrams a day, and that's it. And not even taking it, you know, that that's it. We will never recommend somebody with a heart condition to take an NSAID. So that's why I'm surprised that she talks about taking a non-steroid anti-inflammatory because I would think if she has any displays of the cardiac, which she looks like she's getting really edematous now, which is kind of, kind of a cardiac sign, I hate to say it, um, I would just, you know, I wouldn't have her on the insets, that's for sure. And the liver too, yes, because I think they are metabolized I'd have to check, but I think maturity are metabolized through the liver. And I think that's prob pro part of the problem. And I think that's where the aspirin works for the thinning of the blood because the liver is where all the blood is. Um, so the blood, red blood cells obviously out of the liver, produced out of the liver. So and, as well as your uh, bone marrow. So, but they get cleansed out or taken care of through the liver. <laughs> <laughs> and uh yes the insect she has that liver yeah and they call it a different name now it's not fatty liver they're calling it mess fed or mefed or I, there's a new acronym for it because it's got all sorts of yeah she went to the thrombo clinic weekly uh, i wouldn't be shocked i mean the girl's been flying around a lot lately and i wouldn't be surprised if she had not had some type of issue but I can't imagine them treating it chronically. Oh, I mean, like long term. Yeah. yeah. I would need to know. We would need to know in reality every type of medication she really was taking in order to really know what would be causing that blood thinner. She doesn't even know the name of the NSAID. She just says it's not that one. And I'm just like, how do you not have the bottle in your hand and just read the bottle? <laughs> it's like, I mean, there's so many things that could be potentially done by foodie. You're on the proxen. Okay. You've been retaining fluid. Well, I would definitely take a look at that. I would let, if, if, if somebody's prescribed that, I would certainly let them know that you're having that potential um, side effect just to make sure that they're okay with you remaining on the proxen. Or, you know, another way is you just weigh yourself every day. And uh, if you go up three to five pounds suddenly with a heart failure patient, that's a sign that that's not good. <laughs> but I don't want to get into the water weight. Gosh, that water weight, wild. Okay, let's get back to foodie. Mm -hmm. Slow down. Yeah, these pickles, I think I said this before, but they're like little cucumbers, but they're, um, look how small this one is. They're not dill. They're tarragon. Oh, here we go. Oh, so this is, this is perfect, because we've got a question about this, and we'll finish it up, because I know everyone's good at least. Okay, so actually, this is great, because this is the question that came in. 
and it says, and yeah, I RGB, I you know, I worked in hospice for quite some time, and I I do get concerned about her levels of energy and her lack of true medical care and what can eventually happen and her apathy at the moment. It's it's and she's very depressed and the depression actually can go with those cardiac that is very hallmark with people having cardiac or sorry I should go back heart problems or is is depression. So her getting more depressed to me as a heart nurse a cardiac nurse could potentially be making me think that she is getting more impacted by her cardiovascular system and she's just not aware. And because she's kind of in a rut with the depression that kind of comes with heart problems, sometimes people don't aren't aware that that, you know, could be from a medical factor. And that once they start to take care of the medical and we can actually see that they are having symptoms of depression, then we can get them managed for the depression and get them proper medications prescribed as well as get any referrals that we need. And I've had to do that. So, I mean, that's very, very, um, that I will, I'm going to look at this Joe Plater person. I will. I will. I love investigating. I've been investigating somebody else. Right, at Elrazepam for you or her. Oh, oh, I would like a little little smidgy of Lorazepam. <laughs> After Chantel, watching her eat that pizza and how unwell she is. Yes, and the isolation is debilitating. And I don't think that's helped. And she doesn't have the necessary tools in her sort of mental box to help her, you know, get through times where she is in places alone. Like I'm very adaptive to being alone in places because I traveled from such an early age and I'm very, I love, I have lots of hobbies. I'm very comfortable eating out in places alone, joining gyms, joining clubs, meeting people, you know, having people invite me to dinner, going, you know, so I will just make friends with whatever new town I'm in, you know, and I will seek out others with similar hobbies and try to get to know, I'm not going to be in everybody's business all the time, but I'm certainly going to make sure that I'm active and, you know, just today alone, like I said, I had been with a friend of mine and her daughter with our dogs and at the puppy park. We're out there for a while. And, you know, I've just been busy. Now I'm here. I've just been busy all day. And I can't imagine being with, you know, she can say all she wants about the husband, but in reality, we really know he's not there as a support that she truly needs with facing so many medical issues and problems. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, she would. Oh, yeah. I, oh, gosh. She would definitely be on the, you know, absolutely. She'd be majorly referred to uh, mental health at this time just because of the non compliance, too. Um, trying to help her understand why maybe she's not compliant. But, and that's where the mental health aspect would come in here. So let's read this question real quick. Delve into non-compliant patients, even in the hospital, all we can do is chart and notify doctors. Okay, so this is coming from a healthcare professional. I love it. We cannot make someone do something they won't do, such as a waste, such a waste of resources, get them in the hospital. They eat their three meals, then at night order out. Oh gosh. Pizza, wings, sandwiches, donuts, and sweet drinks. Just ridiculous. Yes. How many of us have seen patients in the hospitals, families bring in full feasts of meals, you know, because they want to bring them comfort foods while they're in the hospital or things they like to eat because they don't want to eat the hospital food. Yeah. Um, we just have to kind of hope that we can keep educating patients and families and involve families and those who are uh support systems for the patient 
and trying to continue to educate. I think education is the biggest piece that we have to try to do. I think when people can understand why it's important for them to do something for their health or their body, then that becomes easier if you're not dealing with mental health. And that's a whole other piece that I think is the part where non-compliance happens. That is where you're dealing with very distinct, very, you know, documented personality types that have histories of non-compliance. Then you're going to have to try to get mental health in there. Then you may never get the patient to comply. And so you're just going to have, sadly, a patient whose health and even potentially mental health will deteriorate because they just are unable to get the resources because it's just, it's just, it, it's very hard. It's really hard. It's very hard to see those patients. It's sad. Um... And all you can do is, like I said, put them in front of the resources, try to educate, try to do it that way, and, you know, just kind of keep, you know, doing it. It's frustrating to have to watch them eat these foods, but, you know, they are adults. They are people who have choices. We're not holding them prisoner in the hospitals. Uh, we can only, you know, hope they would make better choices. Um, fortunately, because we are getting so good with medicine and able to have very sick people be kept alive in some ways, then it allows people to feel like I think they have a little leeway to not always, and it's not that you have to be super strict. I promise you, I'm going to have a cookie in a minute. I got these little low sugar almond cookies and they're so good. I just, you know, I, if, you know, so it's, it's not anything about perfection, but there is the time where you just think to yourself, a daily ice cream, probably not a good idea. You know, all these, so, you know, the fries just, you know, when you see your food that brown all the time and you're just squirting ketchup on it too, that should be alarm bells. That should be alarm bells. Okay. I do. My email is on my profile. So if you go into my Life and Vibe page, there's like, if you hit like more information about me and my profile thing that comes up, it will bring up my email address. Sometimes I've cried seeing them. Oh, ah, yeah, it's really hard. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. When you have patients and you know they are still doing harm to themselves and you can't get them to change things and you can't go to their home, yeah, you it's it's hard. It, I don't think that it does impact us as healthcare workers. It really does. All right. So, yeah. Yeah. It's really hard. I had a family, a guy who got stented one day and his family brought him in like, Parties like egg sausage biscuits, like right after a cardiac stent. And the cardiologist was not happy. Please don't do this when you go to the hospital. I mean, I understand, but it's just wild. It's wild. And we see it all the time. All right, what's next? Ah, this was a great one. Oh, I love this question. <laughs> Sherbert Dip Dab obviously was thinking about Foodie and her her eyes lighting up on Delauded. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you had a family deliver deliver donut to a patient? Oh, well, you know, I did. Nightbot was offended. Oh, so Nightbot's in it. Oh, yeah, that's great. Yeah. I always love it when they bring us the donuts, too. <laughs> it's like uh, my patients would always bring us, like, donuts and cookies. I'm thinking I'm working in a cardiac rehab. Bring me some fruit, please. <laughs> Why are you always bringing me this unhealthy stuff? <laughs> please don't do that to me. Bring me bags of nuts. And they started to do stuff like that for me because I knew that's what I preferred. I really did not need to have. And I used to, 
Oh my gosh. I used to work with some, and they're supposedly, I saw this, and I may have to delve into this. Supposedly, there are some very scary nurses eating some really bad food on TikTok. And I've worked with these nurses. They are very unhealthy, I tell you. They are not in good shape. I promise you. We have we have wheelchaired these nurses to the ER because they've had a cardiac event on the floor. So don't think that these nurses, some of these nurses, they don't follow the own the the I don't know what the mentality is on that, but there's plenty of them that do. All right, what are the telltale signs a patient is shopping for meds painkillers? And how is it usually dealt with as a professional? Okay. So this is always very difficult. Luckily, the doctors are the ones who are the prescribing person for these medications or a PA or an MP. And so there are very strict guidelines about when and how controlled narcotics are prescribed. And uh, one of the telltale signs is usually exaggerated pain without really having a known cause for it. So the, you know, the back pain, but, you know, you're not really seeing any inflammation. You're not seeing a bulging disc, you know, certain, you know, signs of that type of behavior. Um, again, uh, so that's probably one of the biggest ones, the exaggerated complaints of pain uh, without a known cause or source of the pain. Having Oh, they're promoting body positivity. Is that what they're doing, Fanny to bed? Oh, well, mm, I promise you, when their backs go out on the floor, they're not very, feeling very positive. Because <laughs> I've seen that happen too. They don't, we, nobody, you know what? When I promise you, when they're having to do a 12, 13 hour shift, they're not feeling very positive by the end of that. It's going to wear you out. But yeah, they don't have a lot of energy on the floor sometimes. So, yeah. Um, I think now there's so many things that would stop somebody from getting the medications that the if you come to the ER and try to get the pain medications now, they're probably going to tell you to get in touch with your primary care. You're not likely to get in the United States prescribed any strong pain medication just going in with pain like they used to. I think doctors are not prescribing because now the doctors are actually being monitored electronically on how and how much they're prescribing. When I did work with cancer patients, we did still have to monitor the amount of controlled narcotics they were taking because sometimes they could get a little bit, you know, we try not to let them take too much of one kind because it would have other effects and they may prefer that kind of medication. And that can be challenging, I think, because the patient is sick, um, but they're still wanting those pain medications. So it's definitely a delicate conversation. Definitely one you have to, pro I think, approach though very sternly and, and not sternly but you have to be direct with the patient and the family so it's not something you're gonna go, skirt around the topic you're gonna you know directly say our concern is that you are not taking the medications prescribed at this time as they were prescribed and so we will be unable to continue or we will not be able to refill them at this time and will not be able to refill them until they are due to be prescribed. You know, um, we did have one case where I had a young man who had sickle cell disease, which has a lot of pain involved with it. He was prescribed uh like hydromorphone or oxycodone or one of these, I think, medications. He was not getting, I guess, enough bang for his buck. 
And so he was selling those on the street. And then he would come in and, uh, you know, he was then taking the money from selling the drugs and going to a, a, a house, you know, to do um, C-R-A-C-K instead. And so I did have to one day, his uh, doctor was concerned and his girlfriend had reported it. And so when he came to see us one day, because he would, they, a lot of times you have, they, they will have more than one provider. Let's put it that way. They will often have more than one provider. And so he came in and I had to do a urine drug screen on him straight away. And I just said, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to do a urine drug screen. Yeah. And he popped positive for cocaine. So we unfortunately had to cut him off as controlled narcotics at that point. So if you are prescribed any pain medication here in the United States, I don't know if it's the same in the Canada or elsewhere, and you are suspected of doing any uh, street drugs and they bring you in to do a urine drug analysis and you pop positive, they will take your pain medications away. So there's a lot more regulation. Um, but being professional and direct, I think, is uh, probably the best way. I've had patients get real, real feisty in, with medications in the hospital. It's, yeah. Most, it's the chart, yeah. Smart, they'll go out of town. Yeah. I mean, they'll do all sorts of stuff. I mean, it's wild. Here in the United States, because it's a pretty big system, and I think they have like a controlled narcotic registry, it's getting a little bit more difficult for patients, which is probably why there's so much more coming, you know, from other sources that are illegal and creating these drugs because people do like them and stuff. Um, because of that. Okay. Let's I think there's only maybe one or two in the more get done. So this was asking, not a question but session. Eugenia Cooney and the Doherty dozen hours of content. Now, Eugenia, I'm not sure about because obviously, now I am, you know, just because I would have one part, the one thing that I would be interested in more talking about Eugenia is not really with her, obviously that is more of a mental health and that's definitely more into the realm of therapy, but more to do with anorexia and its effects on the cardiovascular system, which go hand in hand. So that would be something if I were to approach her as a uh, person here on YouTube, I would certainly want to look at it more from how that, because that's how Karen Carpenter unfortunately passed away. She passed away from a, a heart attack brought about because she had. And so there is a absolute distinct, absolute correlated link between and, you know, there's a lot to do with the proteins. It's it's very fascinating. I wrote a, I really wrote a big paper. Big part. Oh, yeah, I know. They really did mislead people. But it's been so fascinating. It was all, a lot in Virginia, too, where I'm at, the doctors in Virginia. Because, you know, they were, they were misled, too, by those pharmaceutical companies that it was going to help people with their chronic pain. And they started to kind of bring it into the orthopedic. Now, for cancer patients, it is, it is a lifeline for them at end-stage cancer. But, you know, for the orthopedic, I think there's other ways. And surprisingly, I think, and I've been hearing more and more talk about this on the doctor's radio. I heard a really, fa everyone knows I love the doctor's radio. I heard a really fascinating uh, discussion of a doctor and about, you know, smoking marijuana and exercise and how it helps with pain and relieving like knee pain. So people who have orthopedic pain might find, and I'm not suggesting, okay, I'm just saying there's research that shows that actually smoking cannabis or cannabis products, especially, I think they did it on actual flour. There's a whole research I read, I heard about, might actually decrease the pain and allow people to exercise more freely than these other drugs that they try to use. Uh, the Doha D dozen, I heard they eat a lot of junk food. So I'm not familiar with them. I'm always, it's a, like watching a crime being committed. 
Oh, no. Is it going to be something, Mary, I'm really going to be horrified by? Oh, diabetics in the making. Oh, gosh. Oh, is she posting again? Oh. Oh, she only posts if she's monetized? I, I'm not sure. I don't follow them. I've just been asked. I might have to... Eugenie, I'm familiar with her. She's that poor girl. That's such a sad... That's so sad. The stereotype doesn't... I'm going to have to check into who these people are. I'm going to have to double check. Okay, so you had to, pain clinic patients had to sign document if they were getting pain meds that had things that on it like agreed not to ask for refills. Early. Yes, they have to have like, oh, all sorts of, it's a whole new world. They have to have like, yeah, these are patient agreements and all sorts of stuff. Oh, they would trigger you? Uh, would they trigger me too? Oh, they doesn't totally trigger you? Oh, gosh. This sounds bad. And I just, I just, it's, mm. So it always has to be the extreme. Why can't just we be not extreme? <laughs> Hours of content. Oh my gosh. And I would want to try to, you know, approach it. You know, I have some of my roast videos of, of Judy because she's just not being truthful. And sometimes I just think like, but I go through waves where I'm just like, I my nurse heart is like compassion for this person still. And I some parts I, I still want her to get proper care do and I just hope sometimes that she does watch this content and our discussion about her health concern in as respectful a way as possible and actually does something to take care of herself that could be our my only hope from this conversation too and obviously all of you who have benefited from this as well and we're just gonna keep on growing we're little all right that was it everybody okay those were all my questions so thank you guys all for being here this evening i really appreciate you all being here and just being so kind to each other in the chat mm -hmm.